Welcome back to Sunday Vibes one and all. How is it going? Hope you're doing well. Just myself and Doogie this week. How are you doing, Diggs? I'm good. I'm joining the presence of a rock star. People have been enjoying the tunes. They have been. I do really appreciate that, actually. Put the link in the description yeah. on Monday Vibes and Sunday Vibes. Right. You know it's a banger from Sedilia. <laughs> it was just under a week. No, just over a week ago yeah. as you watch this now. Brilliant gig. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was it was great. I had a well, I had a great time, and yeah, I was very very touched that uh, yourself, Dukes, and plenty of the other FD boys Stop came it. down. Um, it. Yeah, it was a real yeah, it was it was a really great night, and yeah, I do appreciate everyone at home who's checked out the song. Um, yeah, it's done quite well, listens wise actually. It's done quite well, and I'm sure that's had a lot to do with platinum. with FD uh, FD fans listening in. Yeah, hopefully soon. Who knows? It's happening. Who knows? If it can, if it can do well enough that Spotify even pay us a pound, I'll be, uh, I'll be very pleased. Get that, um, Freddo. But yeah, exactly. Um, got to, well yeah, got to get some some fruits for our labour. Um, so yeah, really appreciate uh, that. But but yeah, otherwise, how are you doing, Zeke? End good. of the season. End of the season. Yeah, it's a weird. Well, not a weird time necessarily. There's been so much football news this week, which we will be getting onto during the the course of this episode. But yes, the Premier League is wrapped up. There's one more round of fixtures in La Liga and Syria. Um, there's actually two for Atalanta, I believe, because their yeah. game against Fiorentina was delayed after an executive of Fiorentina um, sadly passed away. So they've got two more games to go. But that Europa League final last night, we might as well touch Crazy. on that. I was actually out for dinner with friends, but I caught the last part of it. But what a performance from Atalanta. And you feel Amazing. like having put out the favourites, probably Liverpool in the quarters, you know, who can begrudge them going all the way, winning their first trophy since 1963, I believe, Gasparini's first trophy of his entire career, and the quality of Adam Lookman's goals, particularly the second, and actually I love the third, third one even more, yeah. I think. It's ridiculous. Left foot and right foot, just absolute peaches, both of them. Yeah, I mean, it felt so well-deserved, that's the thing. Like There was no, you know, I think... Th th there's no real sadness to Leverkusen not having a perfect season and getting, you know, getting beaten after finally after 50 games. And I was saying it last night. You know, if there's if there's one manager in world football who 100% deserves a European trophy more than Xabi Alonso, I mean, there's probably a few to be fair, but Gasparini mm. certainly one of them. Like to, for that to be the first major honour um, of his career in that sense is just. It's really mad, like the you know the, the job that he's done at Atalanta has been so good, and just the longevity of, of of what of what he's achieved there is is so so impressive. You know, four you know four or five years ago really was when Atalanta were at their kind of peak hipster popular you know, popularity. You know, making the Champions League quarterfinals, almost beating PSG. Um, you know, like being serious Serie A title challengers at, at points probably being the best team in Italy um, and yet despite the difficulties that he faced in the wake of that you know none more so the kind of situations with with Papu Gomez and um, Ilicic as well. and, and yeah Ilicic, um to, to have kind of rebuilt this team again you know you know you think that Christian Romero being sold and then being replaced by Scalvini you think Edison coming in at the base of midfield someone made. like Adamola Lookman Hoyland leaving for big money last year after just one year at the club um, yeah his ability to constantly evolve this team and I know they've got a great academy but um, and that plays a big part as well but I, I think yeah you just have to give absolute props to Gasparini to become the first first manager to to beat Xabi Alonso this season and do so in such comprehensive fashion Leverkusen just weren't in it after half time mm. they I don't think they even had I'm not even sure they had a shot uh, certainly not a shot on target in the second half, um, at least not until they went 3-0 down. And yeah, just all over the pitch, they were superior, yeah. whether that be in their high pressing, whether that be in the in the midfield. Like Edison had an amazing game. Um, like, yeah, aforementioned Scalvini had a brilliant game at the back. They were just really unbreachable. Um, yeah, it's funny, yeah. actually, in some, of, in some of the WhatsApp groups I have with friends that don't work in football and, you know, aren't as sort of nerdy as we are at Football Daily. And a few of the more sort of I wouldn't say Brexity types, but like pure Premier League fans yeah. were like, who's this Scalvini guy? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, he's breaking into the mainstream in games like this where most most Premier League fans probably don't really watch that much European football except for the big finals or games involving British teams. So it was great to see him sort of cracking the mainstream yeah. as it was. And you say, 
you know, about the players they've lost, but also the, the, the improvement he's got from players that had difficult years last year as well. Like, Lookman had a great year last year, but that wasn't the case for Gianluca Scamacca at West Ham. It wasn't the case for De Castellara at AC Milan. Like, he didn't score a single goal for Milan. And that, you know, to Almost rebuild them last night. back yeah. into the players they, they've become this season is, is super, super impressive. From Xabi Alonso's perspective, I'm actually quite glad that he lost. Not because I didn't want them to compete a treble unbeaten. I think that would have been almost a sort of achievement that comes around once in a lifetime. Like, yeah. I'm not sure whether we would have ever seen that again. But for his own career, I don't know whether you want the perfect season in your first year in management. Like from, mm. from now on, say he goes to Real Madrid next summer or whatever at some stage. Say he goes to Liverpool at some stage. Is winning a Premier League, is winning a Champions League with those teams as good an achievement as winning an unbeaten treble or three trophies with Bayer Leverkusen I'm not so sure so I think for him to keep that hunger there for next year uh, even though they'll be competing at a much higher level in the Champions League but with the way that the the new format the Champions League is as well more games you expect them to Tougher. based on the performances this year you expect them to, to go deep in the Champions League next year and it could be a really special couple of years for Leverkusen as Bayern Munich who are going to get on to go through another managerial change yeah, absolutely. And if Atalanta stay in fifth after those last two games, it will mean there will be six Serie A uh, representatives so in the fun. Champions League next year. I love it. Absolutely. I, I just, I, yeah, I love the fact that the Prem, you know, are not one of those two teams to, to, to uh, uh, leagues to to have reaped the benefits of the coefficient this time round. Um, but let's get into the actual. Uh, meat and potatoes of mm. the episode still the, the fact that Sam hadn't heard of that saying um, <laughs> just just rings around my head now I don't want to say it um, but uh, yeah we're talking about well in light of some pretty wild news this week managerially wise I mean there's been so many managerial announcements this week we've got Thiago Motta going to Juventus I think a great appointment but we've also had some shocks Pochettino leaving company at the moment looking like he's going to take over at Bayern obviously this is uh, recorded a few days in advance but yeah we're going to go through some kind of mad decisions or potentially mad decisions that have already been made and ones that could potentially happen this summer we asked you guys on Twitter to give us your suggestions and we're just going to have a little discussion I guess about them give our give our take on them I, I think we need to start with Pochettino don't That's we Dukes um, obviously, the announcement on Monday in the wake of them securing European football next season. There were, of course, rumblings in recent weeks that Pochettino was was less than happy with his position um, at the club. Um, but I mean, it nevertheless, came as a shock given, you know, the, the, the options available to Chelsea now, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, by the time Sunday comes around, you might know his it's replacement um, I feel like it will be done relatively quickly but we definitely know that he's out the door and it was by mutual consent which I think is worth clarifying it did feel like he was slightly grating with the sort of situation uh, and we'll expand on that situation in a second but prior to that game against Nottingham Forest he was saying you know everyone's talking about whether the owners and sporting directors are happy you know it's not un it's not unheard of for a coach to walk and a, a coaching staff to walk and it did feel like you know he did slightly rein in that sort of those public sort of protrusions of unhappiness, but it wasn't always felt like they were necessarily singing on the same hymn sheet. I think the Conor Gallagher situation is clearly one that Pochettino wants to keep Conor Gallagher. It feels like the club still haven't offered him enough uh, reassurances to stay. It feels like they want to sell him to make more pure profit for PSR or FFP or whatever form it takes in the next couple of years. But there were clear signs towards the end of the year that he was getting it together or at least improving the team in terms of results because actually I think we've been saying it all season the underlying numbers their performances weren't as bad as their results suggested yeah. but at the end of the season they lost one of their final 15 league games not always totally convincingly but that is pretty impressive good. they won their final five they finished sixth that secures Champions League football as Mikey says most likely in the Europa League if uh, Man City beat Man United today as we watch oh no it's tomorrow as you watch this so you'll already know the result of that they finished six places and 17 points better off than in 22 23 that was i think fifth best in europe in terms of an improvement from last year and then you've got stuttgart you've got leverkusen you've got Hirona and teams like that above chelsea so it was really pretty impressive but from everything i've read it did feel like some a some chelsea fans never truly accepted him felt like the board maybe didn't see him as 
a natural fit in terms of that squad because he had been arguing that he wanted some experienced players, some experienced players that he'd worked with before to be brought in. They didn't necessarily want to do that. There was concerns that his training methods were maybe a little too intense physically, which I think is an easy excuse to make. It felt like a lot of the medical staff that were there under Roman Abramovich have now left the club and they've just missed an ent- they've missed huge swathes of their season. I think it was over 2,300 days missed combined it injured from that squad, which is over 1,000 or close to 1,000 more than they missed in any of the five previous seasons. So Chelsea players were really struggling with injury this year, and he didn't feel like he was necessarily completely behind the project. There was reports in The Athletic that he didn't necessarily see Moses Caicedo and Enzo Fernandez as a dream duo. He doesn't see Enzo Fernandez as being creative enough to play as a number eight or destructive enough to play as a number six. He had some concerns over their physical stature or lack of it. You know, in previous teams under Pochettino, it's been Victor Wanyama, it's been Moussa Dembele, etc. You know, his best his best Spurs side had Moussa Dembele as that sort of all-conquering physical specimen in the middle of the park. So you could see that they didn't necessarily rub up completely the right way. Having said that, I'm massively surprised, hugely yeah. surprised. This will be their fourth permanent manager in just over two years. You also throw Lampard in there as well as a sort of caretaker. Where is this project at? You know, it's supposed to be a long-term project with all these young players. You've just fired yeah. a manager that has a history of improving young players over time. And yes, it wasn't always a natural fit this season. He played players out of position. I don't think they played well enough in the first half of the season. Some of his tactical decisions have to be questioned. But the names they're being linked with really concern me. Yeah, it is, it is a bit maddening. Um, it, it seems like the, the weirdest timing, especially when you look at, you know, you look at you know, Man United, for example, who like it's gone quite quiet it may not have to be fair in the wake of what may be a, 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 mm. a you know a big defeat against man city on saturday uh, maybe talk but but up until the fa cup final at least there was very little talk about you, you know the talk had gone quiet about them and i think it's because you know th- th- there's a lack of managerial talent out there and for chelsea a club who's whose manager is in you know is in a far better stock than than united's to to take that leap it just it just feels so risky and like yet yeah, like you're saying there's obviously reports about the training methods etc apparently there's you know there was a sense that tactically Pochettino wasn't uh, doing enough on the training pitch which I, f- I find uh, I find that a little bit rich to be honest I think Pochettino is one of the best tacticians out there and yet like there's aspects like set pieces which Chelsea haven't been anywhere near good a- 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 enough at this year and you know I'm sure you know there may well have been tension between the club and and Poch over that I, I know they hired a new set piece coach or hired someone new in to, to head up a set piece kind of arm of the coaching staff this year so details like that you can get but then you have to look at you, I think you have to look at the bigger picture here right like he was massively popular with the players which I think is really really difficult with a squad that size with players coming in and out of injury um, you know with players who are having to sit on the bench a lot with players yeah who aren't getting the game time that they would otherwise probably get in a in, a, in another side um, you know D, you know someone like Raheem Sterling who's a who is a veteran dropping him for Mikhailo Mudrik you know like these are not easy decisions for a manager to pull off and Pochettino managed to do it and remain popular within the dressing room and you know was winning over the fans even by the end um so yeah I think he had an immensely difficult job and I think we we kind of said at the start of the season it's it's you know it is the toughest job out there and yet Pochettino was probably one of a few candidates who was you know, potentially good enough to do it. And mm. I think I think he passed. I think he passed the season. And like you say, Dukes, I mean, the possible replacements, one of whom may have been picked by now, but Kieran McKenna, as this goes out, it looks like Brighton are leading the race for him. But I mean, this is a manager who is, I mean, he has achieved something truly remarkable with Ipswich. I don't think there's many managers who can really compete with what he's achieved over the last two years, even, you know, even looking at the top level to to have dominated League One in the in the way that Ipswich did and then dominate the championship in the way they did with not that much of a change in no. personnel in the squad um, is really, really remarkable stuff. Like, he is clearly someone who has the, the credentials to go right to the very top. Um, but, 
does that mean he will thrive in the very unique situation that presents itself at Stamford Bridge? I'm, I'm not so sure. Like uh, it's it's a really tough one to look at. Then you look at Enzo Maresca, who's also um, on the short list, of course. Worked under Pep Guardiola at Man City, clearly has good credentials. But then you look at the second half of the season with Leicester, and you know doubts begin to creep in there. Like get, especially given Leicester had, I think, clearly the best squad in the Championship uh, this season. You know. Uh, that lack of consistency would concern me. And then you've got Sebastian Hernes, who has already rejected Bayern Munich. It just doesn't look like they'll be able to get him out of Stuttgart. And, and, and he's, never got, he's playing in the Champions uh, ne- League next year. Yeah, nevertheless, well, he's playing in the Champions League next year. And and also is, you know, I, I think he's great. And I don't actually think he would have been a bad fit at Bayern Munich at all. But I think it's one thing t- t- taking on a, a bigger job in the Bundesliga Um it's, it's another thing entirely going to the Premier League and going to Chelsea. Um, I think even, to be fair, even going to Bayern Munich right now is is a very difficult task, certainly compared to, say, the job that Niko Kovac took on you know, five years ago. Um, but I think for, for Hurlis, it would still be you know, a big risk. Um, there's just, you know, Thomas Tuchel clearly hasn't featured in their thinking. I think that's who all the fans would want. But clearly, you know, it fell would out, be fell, too embarrassing. Fell, fell them, out, yeah. yeah, fell out with them prior to prior to being sacked in 2022. Um, so yeah, it would be a bit of a, a weird step for them. But I mean, where, where do you look beyond that, Dukes? Is there anyone out there? Like, do you, could, uh, w- would there be someone in? I mean, I know like Motta's gone to Juventus now, but would he have been a better candidate? Would there? I, I mean, it's, it's easy to look to Italy and Serie A when you're thinking of Chelsea because of their great mm. um, kind of history with with Italian coaches. But like, is there anyone else that you would have? I mean, the dream would be like someone like Simone and Zaghi. Yeah. But what? Why? So many of these managers. Why would they want to join Chelsea right now? Honestly, why would you want to become the fourth permanent manager in under just over two seasons? Even though you've got the resources in front of you, you've got these players that some have proven themselves to be not good enough. Some of us, some of them really need time, but most of them are on contracts for the next seven, six, seven years. Um, And uh, there's also this want to sell the players that are most closely, closely associated with that club, that are the leaders in the dressing room, the ones that set the tone, you know, the the Cobham graduates. I don't know why Simone Inzaghi or a manager of that caliber would want to join Chelsea right now. Mm. Thomas I mean, Frank has been talked about as well, but I think, I think he's, he's staying keener on staying at Brentford, yeah. which makes sense. Would you want to take a risk on someone like Andoni Areola? Is that even that big a risk compared to Kieran McKenna? Probably not, but he's just signed a new deal at Bournemouth. Gary O'Neill will probably get a top job at some stage, but it's a little bit early, I would say. Like, there's no. It doesn't feel like they're really missing out on anyone right now, which is why I don't think you get rid of the guy who's got one year of experience working with these players, who the players seemingly, I mean, it's impossible to be unilaterally liked amongst a squad of 25, but from public announcements so far and reports since, a lot of them are pretty shocked and probably feeling quite let down about where this entire project is going, that they've signed up to for not just their next three years, their four years, the next eight years, some of them. The majority of their careers, right? Like you look at the, yeah, the kind of public, um, kind of reaction from someone like Nicholas Jackson, who you know has has had to has suffered a, a fair amount of flack from both Chelsea and rival fans this season, and yet has Finished ended the season yeah there. ended the season really strongly and and clearly enjoyed working under Poch. Like I think you know his all round game generally looks really good under him. Look at what like you know, you have to give Poch credit for some something like Cole Palmer as well. I mean like when was the last time we saw an individual season that impressive from a mm. Chelsea player? I can't maybe what Frank Lampard Eden Hazard probably Eden Hazard like Pochettino's uh, I- I- ability to to get those kind of performances out of someone with very little Premier League experience can't you know can't be underestimated um, but I guess let's get on to uh, while we're on the subject of Chelsea at Team OT sent in their potential massive mistake uh, that their club could make this summer and it is we've touched on it already but selling Conor Gallagher Dukes um, I mean in some ways, is this as silly a decision now that Pochettino's left, given that the next manager who comes in may not be, I don't know, a Conor Gallagher manager. I don't know mm. what a Conor Gallagher manager is. I know, obviously, he's got the great connection with the club, but 
yeah, what, what, what do you make of it? I see your point, but at the same time, I'd be reluctant to, given the way he finished the season. I, you know, in January, when I, we were talking about this for, for this summer, I didn't necessarily have too big an issue with it because he wasn't playing nearly as well. And Conor Gallagher's a strange one in that I'm not sure he's ever going to be of the level of Chelsea's best midfielders of the past. The ones that won the league titles, you know, on the, the Lampards, the Fabregas's, that, that sort of level of player. But at the same time, he's now an experienced England international. He was your most used player last term. I think he finished with 12 league goals and assists, despite changing into a variety of different positions. In terms of his stats, in terms of shots, passes into the final third, carries, the whole lot. He's in the top three for pretty much everything in Chelsea's squad. And he was your captain at points last season. I just don't think £40 million or £45 million mm. is worth it in the short term. Uh, you know, if it if they don't have enough players to sell to make their squad work and to balance the books, then yeah, I suppose they have to. And is it the biggest disaster ever in the long term? No, but in the short term, I think it could be really damaging. Yeah, I, I guess my my counter to that would be that if selling Conor Gallagher, because obviously as an academy player, you know, Chelsea selling him turns up as pure profit on the books. It's really really beneficial for PSR compared to say selling. I don't know, uh, Badia Shield yeah. or you know whoever who they who they've signed in recent years, even a Raheem Sterling. If they were to sell him, if, if selling Gallagher meant that they could, they actually were able to, within the rules, go out and spend big on a Thiago Silva replacement, whether that be someone I don't know like Scalvini, who we were just talking about, like would then that be worth it? Because Chelsea clearly haven't struggled in an attacking sense this term. It very much has been the defence, and that's where I feel like the major surgery is needed. Mm -hmm. But Which then you're also like their midfield depth isn't amazing. To be honest, mm. it's like Uga Chukwu, Lavi has missed an entire season of football. Like, are you confident that either of these two players are going to get to Conor but, Gallagher's but, level? But equally, in I the next two years. But I, but I also think that has Enzo Fernandez ripped up any trees since well, being there? Well, I, well, I mean, this is the problem that Chelsea have, right? Is that Whoever the next manager is really needs to make it work with Enzo Fernandez. Mm. I know Caicedo has like you Finished know second half strongly. second half of the season was really good, but like they've still got on a hundred and ten million pound asset there, who is yet to uh, you know yet to perform on a consistent basis at Chelsea, and if Pochettino you know really did have a problem with those two, the next manager really can't like I, I mean the next manager's got to make it work otherwise, you know like. Chelsea just don't really have a midfield um, like I, I think they probably will sell Gallagher this summer that's my gut feeling like it feels very likely it, th there's been so much talk about it for so long uh, like especially, left especially, in especially well, with so. Pochettino leaving now like what really is the reason for them to keep hold of him from their perspective um, so, I know so whoever comes in like really needs to make it work I know he'll have an amazing loyalty to the club the club's brought him through the club's made him the player he is today but honestly, if you're looking from a footballing perspective and Spurs yeah. are on the table right now, or this Chelsea side and another new manager, if I was Conor Gallagher, I'd be asking for a move as well. So it, it feels like it will. I, co I completely agree with you. It feels like it will happen. Yeah. Um, Conor Gallagher, yeah, Spurs does feel like the, the, the more likely destination, doesn't it? Um, OK, should we move away from Chelsea now? I feel like we've spoken about them for quite a while. Let's go, I guess, to the other big news this week. Bayern Munich... Not sure whether it will be official by now, but I mean, Vincent Company looks Lucky pretty man. pretty dead set to go there. I mean, what a fall up this is! It's brilliant, uh, brilliant for him. Um, unbelievable, unbelievable. I, I just a few weeks ago, people were criticising Liverpool moving for Arna Slot. Yeah, you know, a guy that's won the Eredivisie, a guy that's won the KNVB Cup, and now we've got Kieran McKenna being the favourite for the Chelsea job, and Vincent Company. <laughs> close to joining Bayern Munich like what is going on <laughs> seriously what is going on they I know okay I'll get into company and his backstory and his leadership yeah. abilities but Burnley last year you can criticize the squad you can criticize the signings they didn't adapt quickly enough to what was required in the league yeah. they shot themselves in the foot consistently I think some of their players really struggled to adapt to the Premier League is that the players fault is that company's fault it's probably a little bit of both okay. but there was nothing in Burnley last year that made me think this manager is ready right now to go to one of the biggest they clubs only won in five games and three of those games were against Shef two of those games were against Sheffield United one of those games was against Luton I think the other game was Brentford so the only 
team that they didn't beat that was wasn't in relegation trouble at some point in the season was Fulham, and it, and Fulham were you know wildly inconsistent at points this term. Like I mean, it's yeah, it it's is crazy. startling in that and, sense. And you know, Bayern were always going to take some flack for whoever they appointed. They were down to their what seventh, eighth choice. You know, some of those choices not they haven't probably gone as deep as others, but they were really da- far down the list. You know. Eric Ten Hag had reportedly been talked about. Oliver Glasner, who'd just gone to Crystal Palace, etc. Vincent Company can speak German from his time at Hamburg. Obviously has amazing standing in the game from his time at Man City. He's got brilliant leadership abilities. You can see that he's clearly got managerial, you know, the, the makings of a great manager. You look at the football Burnley played in the championship. And in some ways, yeah. his skills are probably more suited to Bayern than Burnley trying to play in the Premier League without the players to do so yeah. having lost lots of their best players on loan he improved a lot of players that came on loan as well but it's a huge job for someone with that level of experience when they've shown very little time for managers like Ancelotti Nagelsmann Tuchel Kovac who I mean Kovac less so but they've all achieved far more in the game I think it's a huge huge risk and one that you know it might turn into Xabi Alonso Mark II but Xabi Alonso hadn't hadn't had the stain on his record that company has had in 23 mm. 24 with Burnley. Yeah. I mean I, I guess it's also telling that Burnley, you know, want to keep company and were willing to ba- were very willing to back him back in the championship as well. Um like he's 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 not a manager who so far has not had the backing of of the teams that he's he's managed in that sense. Um which you know which is promising and I mean you talk about Xabi Alonso, I mean one thing that we will be greater to next season, if he, you know, if he if he does get appointed, is I mean, will that be the classiest match up in in world <laughs> football at that point? Leverkusen versus Bayern, Company versus Xabi Alonso on the touchline, like the, two, two of the nice. two of the kind of classiest yeah. footballers of, of modern times up against each other. Um, so I mean, that'll be that'll be lovely. That'll be a bit of a fashion show, but um, <laughs> but yeah, I I I. I yeah, I completely see your point, Dukes. I think, look, it's an amazing opportunity for company, and yeah, uh, I, I, think, I think I think the problem the problem for company is is that, yeah, he he just hasn't managed as an institution anywhere near the size of Bayern yet. And yes, he's, you know, he he was used to, you know, he he you know he worked under Pep, he worked under Mancini, worked under Pellegrini, you know had the pressure of going back to Anderlecht and and trying to make things work as well and he did a very admirable job at, at Anderlecht but nevertheless it's like coming into Bayern who are in transition themselves you know Christoph Freud and Max Ebel the the sporting director and, and sporting CEO have, have barely got their feet under the table yet and this is a huge call from them um and not given, the first given, call they've tried to make yeah as well. and, and given, given the amount of ground that they now have to make up on Leverkusen next season as well let alone the fact that RB Leipzig may well be even stronger next year um, as you know Stuttgart may well be even stronger next year with, with, with Hernes there for another season at least um, Uli Hernes is still an incredibly vocal you know spokesperson for Bayern and and, and you know made Thomas Tuchel's life difficult there like how does he deal with the pressure of that like the politics of Bayern is the thing that I think uh, uh, company will struggle with the most yeah um, I mean that and, and the maybe point. the dressing room a little bit as well you know Manuel Neuer is older than company like wow. he's, he's a few weeks older than company so while I think company will have the respect of the dressing room generally speaking if things start to go wrong you know We've seen how that dressing room can, can become split. Yeah. Um, look, you know, look at what was happening in the Nagelsmann days. Even you know, look at the kind of various reports about like which players supposedly wanted Tuckle to stay and who wanted Tuckle to leave. You know, it's just it, it's, it, a it's, it's, it's a circus. It's a circus. It is a circus, and um, and yeah. So best of luck to company if he, yeah. if he, if he gets this well, job. But it is yeah, it it's is a, a bad one. That was the thing I was going to point out. Is really that company joined. And kind of the club, and he kind of built City. The, the club yeah. built around him. Like, he is joining a, a kind of soap opera at times at Bayern Munich. And yes, I think reports are exaggerated because they are by far the biggest club in Germany and they hoover up the most news. So in a similar way to Man United, journalists do spout a lot of rubbish about Bayern Munich. Like, you do kind of have to check on some stories' truth. But it does go to show that he is joining the most talked about club in Germany, the one that hoovers up maybe 70% of all news stories in Germany in a way that no club in the UK kind of does to that extent. 
and he's joining it at a time where he's got very little experience, at a time where managers like Thomas Tuchel, Nagelsmann, Ancelotti have already pointed out have been deemed to fail. And the squad has seesawed in terms of what they wanted at different points. Like Pep, when they left, they were apparently relieved because training was too intense. Then Ancelotti started, they loved it, and then it became too easy. Nagelsmann was too much of a joker because he arrived on a skateboard. Like, the, it is honestly, they'll find any reason to, to create an issue. And there's always some executive, whether it's Hassan Salihamidzic or Uli Honus, who is creating some sort of issues behind the scenes as well. So many different opinions, such a historic club so determined to sort of right the wrongs of last season as well and maybe yeah. in that respect he's joining at a good time because expectations are lower than they would be otherwise but at the same time they will be so determined for it not to happen again this been uh, this season has been an embarrassment for Bayern. take away the champions league it has been a true embarrassment to finish third in the bundesliga he will be under pressure from the get-go they will expect a league title they will yeah i mean they always do don't they but i mean yeah Worst league position, what, since 2010-11? I think most defeats in the league since 2006-07. Like, he is joining them at, at a low. Um, but I guess the advantage is that he does have a squad there that, you know, there are players experienced enough where some of that management on field can be done from the players. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's really tough, but who knows? I, I think it, it, it goes one or two ways. I think it's going to be either an absolute disaster or an absolute stroke of genius. I don't think there's going to be a middle <laughs> ground with this one. I really don't think there's going to be a middle ground. Um, speaking of problematic clubs, I guess let's go to Barcelona. Um, because on they do play Sevilla in their final La Liga game tonight. Second place is secured. But Xavi's future is not. I mean, like, I mean, this, uh, speaking of, like, you know, soap operas, this really has... You know, Laporta, Xavi stuff ha has really come to a head in recent weeks. Those comments that Xavi made before the Almeria game, which I don't think were particularly crazy, to be honest. No. Just, just you know, tempering fans' expectations about the club's financial situation, which is very well known. And, you know, but at the same time, I guess also saying that, you know, they need they need new signings. Otherwise, they're not going to improve. I guess that does put, you know, that did put pressure on Laporta just a few weeks after, you know, they'd eating sushi and you know shaking on on their future together um yeah there is clearly tension between Xavi and the Barcelona board and you know if reports are to be believed Hansi Flick is in place to to take up the reins should Xavi leave um Dugues I mean what do you think Barca's best option is here I mean at least at least in this sense there is it's one or the other it's mm. Xavi or Flick there's not there's not a um, you know, short list of, you know, championship managers that um, Barcelona might be looking at uh, if Xavi were to go. Um, but again, it just feels like, it just feels like another risk to take on a manager who will, you know, demand a higher wage than someone say like Rafa Marquez, um, you know, doesn't offer the stability of someone like Xavi who has at least been with this with this squad for nearly three years now um yeah it, it, again it, it feels like another step backwards for me the thing is it's so it's a really difficult one to judge because yeah. if they hadn't have had that dinner and decided that he was going to stay no one would really be surprised by him leaving at the end of the season mm. i think it's just the manner that it's happened the u-turn or the apparent u-turn which just gives this uh, just a feeling of complete chaos and just like fumbling but, around in the dark. But but, but, e but equally, it's like if yeah, if they hadn't done that, if they hadn't secured his future, then surely we would be expecting by now to know who the next Barcelona manager mm. is. Or we would have been expecting it maybe three weeks or a month ago to know who the next Barcelona manager was going to be. Well, exactly. They've missed three, four weeks of negotiating with any manager who was on the table at that point. Like at a time and they've waited until a point where you know Milan well now Chelsea Bayern are still looking for their boss Napoli are still looking for their boss you know they are not necessarily at the top of the pecking order Xavi did I think on reflection I think he did a solid enough job at Barcelona in the circumstances there was a huge drop off this year but there was progress in Europe but at the same time, it's a really difficult job for anyone to go into and succeed with the financial constraints around them and with the fact that their their wage budget for the next year has dropped from about 500 and something to 174. So they, there's huge issues in terms of making their salary cap for next year. There's going to be more players that have to be sold. 
would it, would it be better place to have Janvi in there, who is at least the best thing that emerged from this year was his trust in La Masia products. You mm. know, Yamal, Kubasi, Gavi prior to his injury was playing excellent football as well. So would it be better of a place to have stuck with Ga- uh, Janvi than Hansi Flick, who hasn't managed a club game since 2020, who had that really disappointing and quite confusing spell in charge of the German national mm-hmm. team in that documentary at the World Cup really didn't do him any favours either, mm-hmm. uh, especially because he knew most of those players from Bayern Munich. It's a strange one. Some of the football they played at, at Bayern Munich was was amazing in that treble winning season. So but then good. they had a much, much better team than Barcelona. And they had a peak Lewandowski who was scoring a ridiculous amount of goals. It's one of those ones where I actually don't really feel that strongly either way. I'd have probably, having said I was going to keep Xavi, keep Xavi because it makes your club just look like an absolute PR disaster. Mm. But Hansi Flick, for, for the situation they're in, I don't think is a shocker. Yeah. I know what you mean. I, I feel relatively conflicted uh, about this, partly because, yeah, the, the, the situation around Xavi has been so strange. And I think, yeah, whatever happens, Barcelona are going to be fighting a losing battle next season. You know, Real Madrid with Mbappe, with Alaba back, with Militao back, Courtois with Courtois back. back. Potentially Alfonso Davies through the door as Fully well. Fully fit Guler as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, they'd be a match in any league. I think they'd be a title contender in any league next season. Um, you know, you, you look at the points tally they rocked up this year in a season when I don't think they were actually all that impressive. Like, mm. at least not in an attacking sense, really. They can uh, finish with 97 like, points. Yeah, they? they can finish with 97 points. And it's mainly off the back of an incredibly well-drilled defence and, and an injury-hit defence at that. Like, amazing job from Ancelotti. But, you know, they're, they're, they're nowhere near as entertaining a side as, say, Inter or um, Arsenal or you know, Leverkusen or, 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 even, or City, even Bayern yeah. this season or more Man City. Um, and and that's what, but, but and, and yet they're going to improve massively next season already off the back of a huge points tally. Yeah, Barcelona, you know, are, are going to struggle to, to keep up with Real Madrid over the next few years. Um, but I think the most worrying thing, I think, for Barca is, is, is the kind of division that's now been created among among fans as well. You know, for the first time in his second reign at the club, we've seen fans begin to become a bit disgruntled at Laporta, you know, mm. backing Xavi over him amid these recent reports of, of, of tension between them. They were, you know, shouting kind of Xavi C si, Laporta no on the weekend, which is, um, you know, which is which is pretty mad. Like, a, you know, you, you the fans have generally been pretty loyal to, to Laporta over the, over the last couple of years. Um, so yeah, it'll be really interesting to see where this, you know, if there's another twist in this tale, I wouldn't be surprised if there is and Xavi just stays. Like I wouldn't be surprised after all this time, you know, we've seen it happen already. Um, the amount of U-turns has just been pretty wild. Um, but yeah, is, is Flick the guy, like, like you say, like he has played some brilliant football. And I think the Germany job, you know, at the 2022 World Cup, like, you know, those results were it kind of belied their actual performances they should have scored a lot of goals um they probably should have got through that loads group, of chances, yeah, yeah. Uh, based on based on their attacking displays they, they should have made it through um and and yeah that that i don't think that that treble winning season at Bayern some ways doesn't get talked about enough like it was really remarkable given where they were before he took over the kind of football that he was able to get them to play like they were far and away the best team 29 in the world. match unbeaten run or amazing it's crazy the pressing, the pressing football was was brilliant. You know, he he got Thomas. T- uh, he he arguably got the best football of Thomas Muller's career out of him. Mm. And at Barcelona, he would at least have some instant allies in there. He'd have Lewandowski in there. He'd have Gundogan. He'd have Tostegen, like players that he knows well. Like there would be, you know, the, exp- the the most experienced players in that squad would be, you know, you know, would be very good candidates for him to kind of form a a kind of leadership team around so it wouldn't be all bad and you know we've been saying it for years maybe Barcelona do just need to take a bit of a risk and go for someone who's completely unaffiliated with the club and and, you know go for a bit of a culture change in that sense but yeah whoever's at Barcelona next season fighting a bit of a losing battle I suspect Hmm. Um, okay sticking on Barcelona speaking of which uh, Leo uh, Kovac Zrakic a long time contributor to so Sunday Leo. Vibes and Continental Club. Um, selling Araujo or Rafinha, um, yeah, we've spoken about it. Barcelona may well have to sell a star this summer. Who would you, if you had to choose between the two? I mean, I, I guess it's Rafinha. 
if you had to sell one of them? I don't know. I think they've got better depth at centre back. I'd maybe sell Arajo. I mean, give it, I mean, Arajo is, I think, a better player than Rafinha and is showing better form for Barcelona for sure. And is, but you're you're more likely to make more money on Arajo as well. And they don't have a lot of forward options at the moment. Whereas at centre back, they've got Kubasi, they've got Kunde, they've got Christensen, they've got Inigo Martinez who's still there, who they could extend for another year. Whereas Arajo could fetch. Desperately need a right back though if they are going to sell it. Yeah, back. true. <laughs> I think Arajo could fetch 60 to 70, 80 million pounds, something in that sort of ballpark. Whereas Rafinha, I don't think anyone's paying over 40 probably for Rafinha, even though he's had a reasonably 50. good end of the season. Um, so, and Arajo also, they signed for what sort of 4 million euros as well. So that is a huge upturn in terms of profit, whereas Rafinha costs so much already. I mean, ideally, I wouldn't sell either. But if they do have to sell one player, I'd probably go for Araujo. And I can't really believe I'm saying that because I do rate him really, really highly. Yeah, um, there you have it. Um, let's move away from Barca now um, to a club, well, who, if they weren't to sign a player in a certain position, would be making a mistake. I agree very much with Aiden, 1874. I can't see Liverpool not signing a defensive this midfielder is a, this, this is summer. dead set. What the Liverpool will yeah. sign a defensive midfielder this summer? Just like it just feels like they it feels like they have to really if they if they want to kind of maintain pace with with Man City and Arsenal who have the two best deep lying midfielders in the league by a distance at this at this stage. Um, yeah, I mean we, we've spoken about them a lot, but you know Endo and McAllister both performed very admirably in that position this year but as we've seen you know McAllister far more suited to a to a freer role in that midfield somewhere where he can you know he can defend a bit more on the front foot rather than having to sit um Endo great but also hasn't you know he, he's not necessarily a seven out of ten every single game you know brilliant performance in the Carabao Cup final brilliant performances around that time but hasn't always you know had a bit of a slow start can't necessarily be relied upon also is getting on a little bit they, they need a long term yeah. you know they, they really need a long-term solution in that position Tiago of course has left T Curtis Jones isn't a DM like he is you know got great defensive qualities but isn't a DM I think mm. you know him and McAllister kind of play in similar areas really and then you look at someone like Basetic who you know very impressive young player but missed most of this season through injury and is still very young I think they need to go out and sign um, sign a defensive midfielder I already suggested Adam Wharton for them mm -hmm. as a bit of an outside shout a few weeks ago and I don't know he'd cost an awful lot of money out of Palace I mean if they're demanding 100 million euros for Oli, Oli Glasner I can't imagine what they're asking what they're, what they're asking player, for yeah. for like He's only been England's next superstar defensive midfielder yeah. who is who may well end hey, that's up at Hayden the Euros Hackney. that is Hayden Hackney go and check that go out check out that video uh, go and check out that video we put that out on the on was it Wednesday, Wednesday Tuesday or Wednesday yeah, one of those. Um, but uh, but Adam Morton yeah I mean yeah Hayden Hackney, Adam Morton, and Cobby Maynu, mate, in the future. Let's that's good. That's going to be them. Let's do it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I suggested him. I, I, I think it's going to maybe be impossible to get Adam Morton out of Palace this summer, to be honest. He only, yeah, only arrived there in January. Um, Dukes, you put down here Polina and Manuel Agate. They mm. seem a lot more gettable. Um, Different it, it, age range, though, very. than the players we're mentioning, particularly well, Joao Agate, I, I mean, uh, yeah, Polina, but Agate I think Agate's is still, 25, maybe? Is, I think Agate is younger than 25. Oh, I think he's a bit younger. Okay. Uh, forgive okay. me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure he's, yeah. They just don't yeah. feel very Michael Edwards, or at mm. least, you know, previous version of Michael Edwards. Let's see what the new one is. But then, I don't know. I don't know. They've already got quite a few older players that are over 30. Salah, Van Dijk, Robertson, Allison, Enders, we've just talked about. Would they... Sign someone who's 28, maybe. I think also Chapelini has such an instant upside, uptick in that midfield. I do think he's he's ready-made mm. to sort of hit the ground running, which might be quite attractive to a manager that's trying to bed in his philosophy and tactics. And, and you know, they probably will sign a couple of players this summer. Um, so, yeah, I think I think Chapelini could be a good fit. I, I would go for Agate personally. I think mm. I think he's a, he's a similar kind of step. Well, not as not as experienced necessarily, but at least in the top five league. But is a, I think he's at a similar stage of his career, developmental wise, to Fabinho when he signed for Liverpool. I think Fabinho was uh, was around twenty five when when he signed, and I, th I think Agate is a bit younger, um, and you know is. 
you know, relatively kind of unsettled at PSG, mm. despite coming in for such big money last year. Like hasn't you know hasn't made the defensive midfield position his own, and yet whenever he does play, puts up an incredible amount of tackles and interceptions. He's you know he can also break the lines. He, he he's he's just a good all round presence there. He's a modern defensive midfielder um, in the same way that someone like Wharton is. Uh, Joao Polina, you know, clearly has been so so vital for Fulham but yeah like just at his age is he someone where in two or three years time you're already having to think about replacing would also just cost a lot out of Fulham as well given like the the price that they were demanding off Bayern Munich last summer yeah I would go for Agate personally but I think we can agree that yeah they they, 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 need do, they do need someone there um, is there anywhere else in that in that Liverpool team that you think Arnie Slot needs investment Let's say Salah. Let's one. say it's, Salah stays this summer. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think they probably they could do with a centre back, maybe. But then Quanza's emergence has really helped them out on that respect. I mean, Matip leaving. Uh, they've now got Bradley to back up Trent. Simakas is doing a pretty able job at left back as a backup to Robertson. They can also got use Joe Gomez there. There's, I mean, if Kelleher leaves, there's probably a backup goalkeeper they need to sign. There's debates about whether Darwin Nunez is is your man, but I think given his improvement this year, at least in terms of his numbers, I'd probably give him another another year at least as, as your main man. Also, just the striker market is, at the moment is just so expensive. Yeah, super um, expensive. I mean, it will be next summer as well, but it just feels like, I don't know, I'd be intrigued to see another year of Darwin Nunez. I'm not giving up on him just yet. I do think he deserves a little bit more time. Yeah, under, under a new coach, but I'm, I mean, in some ways the obvious choice might just be Santiago Jimenez. Like, yeah, I like, I, like I, but look I, at the I number slot juiced out of him as well. Yeah, like. I mean, I, I, I mean, I know it's 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 quite kind of lazy to just be like, here's you know, like sign someone who's worked under the manager before. But at the same time, there's in some ways there's something to be said about that, given the striker market, given the you know the the how, how tough it can be for strikers to adapt to the Premier League, like working under a manager who who has you know made you as a player in many ways. Mm. Um, I think there is something to be said about that. Um, but equally, yeah, they spent a lot on the attack, and if Salah stays, I think I I, I think they'll be all right for goals next year. Um, speaking though of strikers, Josh Hall wrote in to say. Arsenal signing a superstar striker rather than a young one and backing Havertz would be a mistake. What do you think about that? I kind of get his point. I do kind of get his point. Unless you're going to sell Gabriel Zeus. I mean, it feels like Nketiah will probably leave this summer. But I do think Havertz's form down the stretch sort of deserves a little bit more, more time, maybe in that nine role, or at least not, you know, we're signing Victor Osserman to, to replace you permanently and you're, you're playing in midfield or you're a backup nine. I just... I do think it was it was pretty special that run of form. So someone like Benjamin Sheshko, who they keep on being linked to, I think is mm. really exciting. You know, he played a bit of a backup role to Lewis Appenda this season. He's only 20 years old. He's only had one year in a top five league. He's not coming in to to move Havertz aside and say you sit on the bench. You know, the main man's arrived. That will be him in maybe two three years time. But there's enough promise there. You know, he scored 14 league goals in the end. He was the youngest Bundesliga player to ever score in seven consecutive games to finish the season and you know he's got incredible shot power he's really quick he was only clocked running I think two kilometers per hour slower than Haaland last year in the Champions League he's six foot five there is a serious superstar in there but yet it's the kind of player that you sign and he doesn't need to play every single game instantly so there is a variety there and then also he's a very different player to someone like Kai Havertz who's much more of a facilitator in the sort of Bobby Firmino role Sesco would be much more of a pure number nine um I think it'd be really, really exciting. I, when I saw those reports that Arsenal were in talks with Sheshko and they wanted to get the deal done before the Euros, I thought that is really smart. Feels like an Arsenal signing, doesn't it, at this point? Um, Joshua Xerxes is someone we've mm. spoken about a lot in the past as well as, as a Arsenal, um, you know, as an Arsenal signing as well. And, you know, with, with Motta out of Bologna now mm. as well, that he feels even the more guessable, doesn't he? Um, so, yeah, I, I think he would be really exciting signing as well but um but yeah i think either sesco or or um or xerxes would would be great it it, it kind of feels like that's it like like who like osserman just isn't guessable at this stage or at least 
if Napoli were to sell, I just I just don't see them spending that 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 fee. Like I don't I don't know who in the Premier League actually has that kind of money to throw around this summer realistically without making significant sales. Um, Apparently, wants think, to join Chelsea. Well, good luck to him. <laughs> good luck to him. Um, yeah, Osimhen playing under Kieran McKenna next season. I'm sure nice. that's what he had in mind, wasn't it? Uh, when he pushed for that move out of Napoli. I will uh, up. I saw that on the gossip column. Okay, I, I, it might have been Daily Star. Oh, well, know. there you go. Less said about them, the better. <laughs> um, okay, we don't have much more time, to be honest. Let's talk quickly about this point made by at United50. United signing Jeremy Frimpong. Mm. I back this, to be fair. Jeremy Frimpong. Is he really a right back? No. No. <laughs> he could be an Anthony replacement on the right wing. He could wing. literally be an Anthony replacement. I think he, that would actually be a, a, almost a better move. Unless you are signing... You're getting rid of Ten Hag and you're playing at five at the back. I just don't think you signed Jeremy Frimpong this summer. He is not a right back, really. And it would just create further issues down the line. I think, you know, in terms of every stat you'd want from a right back, even in terms of his passing numbers, they're really, really low. He is an amazing... But he's an amazingly quick. He's a great dribbler. He picks up great positions in the final third. He's almost like Hakimi, Prata, uh, the Dortmund Hakimi, or uh, Inter Milan. Hakimi's actually the better shout, really, playing that five of the back system. Just an absolute speedster, relentless energy. Brilliant to watch, but I just don't think Man United are ready to integrate that sort of player into their 11 and use him properly. Um, I think it'd be a waste. The player, the club I'd like to see him go to is probably Denzel Dumfries. Looks like he's leaving Inter Milan. I think him at Inter Milan would be amazing, um, yeah. but I just can't. I can't see him at United. Replacing his fellow Dutchman at, at Inter would be uh, would would be quite a handing of the baton, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, I, I I agree. Unless you're going to go from uh, yeah, like as a right winger, even then, I I don't necessarily see the thinking so much given Ahmad's late season form given Garnacho has looked quite good on the right when he's been called upon there as well a lot rests on whether Rashford um, is is going to leave in the summer but but the reality is I think United have uh, they have bigger issues to spend big money on than than those wing positions actually I, I know that there's not a, a huge amount of depth there but like maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but Garnacho and Ahmad look like a good pairing there. There looks to be a good balance and with a fit and firing Hoyland in between them, I don't think that's the worst um, forward line. Um, and then of course you, you have the possibility of Sancho coming back were Eric Ten Hag to leave. Looks unlikely at this stage, but um, either way, I, I don't, it, it's certainly not where United should be spending the majority. What, what, I mean, what is um, Frimpong's um, release clause again is it like only 35 30, 30, 30, 30 million pounds like something like that it's, it's not a bad price is it it's a really good price for Frimpong so maybe if United have the resources they could do that but yeah certainly not as a right back they they very much need more cover if not a first choice at left back given Luke Shaw and Tyron Malassia's uh, injury problems they need to sign at least one centre back if not two this summer after Van leaving um, and they need another midfielder as well there's a lot of surgery to do at United as always um, structurally I don't think that right wing position or the right back position are really the, the biggest issue facing United at all far from it uh, but that's all we have time for on this week's Sunday vibes um, myself and Dukes are actually both on an end of season break next week so there Party. won't actually be um, there won't actually be any content unfortunately next week but we will be back to discuss the Champions League final between Borussia Dortmund and Real Madrid um, a week on Monday so stay tuned for that hopefully you can keep yourselves busy in the meantime um, thanks once again Dukes pleasure it's been great pleasure. yeah nearly the end of the season I guess Monday that final Monday vibes will be our final one yes of yeah we haven't taken very much season. time off as a duo uh, this season thanks so much for watching all our yeah. content this season it has been a lot of fun it's obviously been quite a turbulent one for Football Daily fans uh, but we will bring you more clarity on what we're planning to do this summer as soon as possible yeah but yeah we'll enjoy the well no, actually enjoy yeah enjoy the Champions League final we'll, we'll see you we'll catch you on the flip side yeah